Hey guys, this is Self Hosted Pro. Today I'm going to be showing you a little bit about DNS. Uh, I've had some questions from people recently that don't really understand what some of these different records do, what their purposes are, uh, and how they relate to the home lab. So to start off with, I'm just going to get started with the most basic of them all, which are A records. For an A record, basically what it is is pointing your domain name at an IP address. Um, by default, they're only for IPv4. You'll use a quadruple A record uh, for IPv6 addresses. Uh, and there are some shortcuts here. So by default, at means the root domain. So the domain in this example is streambands.live. So if I do an at record for a specific IP address, it's going to just point streambands.live at that IP address. And I can go there and access whatever the server whose IP I pointed to uh, is running. Another special character for A records is going to be the star or wildcard record. And what this means is it's going to point all subdomains at that specific IP address. This is what I do uh, for my reverse proxies is I'll point a star record and my at record at my home public IP address in order to forward those requests based on the host name with Nginx Proxy Manager. And of course, you can do any subdomain you want in here. And it will point that subdomain to the IP address that you've specified. Next, we're going to hop into quadruple A records. These are exactly like A records, except for they're for IPv6 addresses. So if you have an IPv6 address as your public IP, you can set both an A record and a quadruple A record at that IP. This follows pretty much all the same rules as the other one where you have the at and the star record for special characters. The next thing we have here is a CNAME record. So CNAME records are pretty cool. What you can do is you can enter in a host name here like test.streambands.live and you can say that's an alias of like google.com. And so now when someone goes to test.streambands.live, they'll automatically be redirected to google.com. Some domain registrars allow you to do masked and unmasked records. DigitalOcean doesn't. What a masked record is, is it means it will forward this host name to this host name. Uh, but instead of showing you google.com in the address bar, it'll just show you test.streambands.live. Uh, this isn't compatible with SSL, and it's not something that you should really be doing. It's not SEO friendly. There's really no reason to do it. Um, so I wouldn't suggest doing that, even if your registrar gives you the option. The next thing we're going to hop over to is MX records. These are mail server records. So what this means is when you create a G Suite account or something of that nature, they'll give you some MX records. And you need to point those MX records to, for example, the one that they give you here is a G Suite record uh, in order for mail to be routed there. And they have different priorities. What this basically means is mail isn't the most stable thing. It's gotten significantly better as of late. But you can have a variety of records here, and if it fails to deliver on the first record, it'll go to the next, and so on and so forth until it, get one, until it gets one that works. Um, this TTL over here is how often they should be checking for a new record. So if you're going to be doing a migration or changing the IP address associated with a record soon, like within the next few days, you should change this down to like five minutes. That way, as soon as you make the change for DNS, it'll be pointing to the new record. But if you're not changing your records frequently, uh, it really doesn't matter what you put in here. Um, just be aware of what it does. Text records are used to associate a string of text with a host name. These are mostly used for verification for things like uh, G Suite, Google Analytics, 
things to help you prove that you own this specific domain name. Uh, Let's Encrypt, a lot of the automated tools there will plug into the API for your DNS provider and automatically create one of these records when you want to do DNS validation for a wildcard Let's Encrypt certificate or something of that nature. These are also used for uh, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC related things. Uh, SPF basically prevents people from being able to spoof your mail server um, because typically they could say that they're sending from your domain, but if you have an SPF record, the SPF record says only servers associated with this IP address are allowed to send mail as me, and if they're not from this domain name or from this IP address, then don't accept the mail because they're spoofing me. Uh, DKIM and DMARC are a little bit more complicated, um, but you won't really run into those in your home lab. It's just if you see them for your email provider, make sure you set them up because they're all about security and making sure people can't pretend to be you and what people should be doing as far as notifying you if they're not accepting your mail or something like that. The next thing we have over here is NS records. So these are basically used to have another service manage your DNS for you. Uh, commonly, if you're running a DNS server at your house and you want to manage all your records there, at your hosting provider, you'll put in your public IP here. You'll port forward port 53 so that way your home DNS server can communicate with the DNS server at your provider uh, and you can create records there. You can also use them for subzones. So if you just want a subdomain and subdomains of that subdomain uh, to be managed by a specific DNS server, you can do that here. SRV records uh, specify the host name and port number for specific services. Uh, you'll run into this if you set up something like Unohost, where they use X, I think it's XXMP, to uh, communicate. Uh, it's not something that I've really run into too much in the enterprise side of things, but if you're self-hosting, you'll definitely want to get a little bit familiar with these things. Uh, so typically, you can see the format that they have over here. It's going to be service.protocol. Uh, so this will be like XXMP. Uh, server.tcp and then it will have the host name to go to when someone goes to this essentially subdomain of yours uh, and it'll specify the port as well and then these have priority and wait uh, I'm not super familiar with either of those I think priority works similarly to how MX records work where you can specify a number of hosts and then based on the priority it'll try the first one all the way through to the last one to see if it's able to connect to any of them uh, for weights, they don't really have a good explanation and I'm not super familiar with them. So CAA records specify which certificate authorities are permitted to issue certificates for a domain. Um, so you'll typically, if you're using Let's Encrypt, you can set it so that Let's Encrypt is the only certificate provider who's able to submit certificates for your domain. Uh, this isn't really a huge security hole uh, because typically the companies that set up SSL certificates have to go through some pretty thorough verification and their reputations are on the line if they uh, miss issue a certificate or something like that but it doesn't hurt to be extra secure so you can go ahead and set this up with Let's Encrypt uh, you can just do a Google search for Let's Encrypt CAA to get it set up there so this is basically what you're going to be running into as far as DNS records go for home lab use. The majority of them are just going to be pointed at your home IP if you're self-hosting or if you're hosting on a server, you're just going to point it to that server IP address. But if you have any other questions as far as DNS goes, be sure to leave them in the comment uh, and I'll see if I can answer them for you or you can hop over to our community discord and I can answer them for you over there. So what an SSL certificate does is it basically verifies that the host name that you're going to, like google.com, matches the IP address for the server that you're being directed to. So if you're curious about how your browser views certificates, you can come up here and you can click on the lock on almost any browser and then click over here and view more information. 
So this is what you'll see basically when you click on that view more. You can see the website, you can see the owner, um, and then you can click on view certificate to actually view the root data of the certificate. So Firefox lets you browse quite a bit of this. And so the, the way that they work is they have a public key and a private key. Uh, so when you request information from a website that's using HTTPS, you'll request with that public key and they'll verify your request with the private key. Um, and that's basically how your browser will know because they are the only ones that have that private key and they publish the public key for you to be able to verify that their domain is the one associated with that key. That's a very basic uh, explanation of how it works, but you can go through here and you can see all of the different information associated with your IP address. So typically this is what you'll see. And it, I guess it's not really that that server's IP address is associated with that domain name. Uh, having an SSL certificate just verifies that that server is allowed to use that domain name because that's the only way that they're able to get a certificate is if they can prove that they own that domain name. And once they do, they have it and they can copy it to as many servers as they want. Uh, like if they have a wildcard domain name or something like that. You can see here we have alts names, which is the domain names that are associated with this certificate. So you have letsencrypt.org and www.letsencrypt.org. You'll see some websites where they have a ton of different DNS names and it can be bad to use the same cert for public and private facing things. With Let's Encrypt, you're only gonna have the domain name that is associated with the server generating that Let's Encrypt. Uh, certificate. So with Nginx Proxy Manager, when you generate a certificate, it's going to be different for each domain because it gets a new one for each subdomain or domain that it's doing. You may see some websites where you can come to this certificate information and view possibly a DNS name that's not one that they should be displaying up here, like internal.letsencrypt.org or something like that. And then if you go to that and successful from the outside, it could be a uh, service that's accidentally been exposed to the internet or something like that. So just one of the things to keep in mind with SSL um, is you typically want to keep production separated from internal stuff, um, but with Let's Encrypt uh, using an automated system like Nginx Reverse Proxy Manager, it kind of takes care of a lot of that stuff for you. Uh, the way that Let's Encrypt works is they're basically a certificate authority and they have an automated system for verifying that you own a specific IP address. So what happens is when you run CertBot, it will generate a specific web page and tell their servers to, hey, check this web page for me. And if you see me, then give me this certificate. Uh, and their servers will verify it, and once everything is good on their end, they'll give you that certificate, and then CertBot will put that in the right place for you. With DNS validation, you're using, you're using a text record to verify the same information of, I own this domain name. But that's basically the basics of DNS and SSL. If you want some more in-depth stuff on either one of those uh, types of technologies, feel free to ask me a question or come into our community discord and ask away. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to be having part two of that sonar and radar video where I go over our BitTorrent client as well as our indexer and then part three will be coming out the following week. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, like, subscribe, hop on our Discord server, and come chat with us. Let us know what you think of our template repository that I showed off in the last video, and let us know if there's any services you want added to that. Or if you're having some trouble getting something set up in your home lab, make sure to let us know, and we'll see if we can help you out with it.